Yay. We're all synced up. You just need to learn a three-way uh, fusion dance. Ooh. Don't we get some kind of cool special name when we do that? Yeah, it would be all our names smashed together. So, deny, denatric. Yeah, that sounds right. Denatric. Peen. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, I think, uh, I think denatric is uh, probably it. <laughs> <laughs> sounds kind of French. Yeah. We will be uh, an Eldrazi human horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Commander Time. All right. Welcome to Commander Time. We are yet another podcast about the Magic the Gathering format known as Commander. And according to EDH Ryan Seacrest, this is our 10th episode, so we are now an actual podcast. Hooray! Yay! Yay! Thank you for listening. I am Nate Burgess. I'm Dean Goody. And I'm Patrick Cipolla. Today, we're going to talk about some basics. And this time, we're talking about threat assessment. It's an important topic. Yeah, it is. It's probably the most important topic. It's it's definitely up there. Then after that, we'll talk about some games we played. We'll tell you what our pets have been doing. And along the way, maybe you'll hear a goofy song. But first, shout out to our patron of the week, Jeremy Barnett. The main topic. All right. Yeah. So we got some references. I looked in Google for threat assessments and MTG and found a bunch of articles. There's one by the Ferret in 2008. There's one by Miu on 2013. That's from Wizards and MTG Salvation. Then Abe Sargent in 2014 on Gathering Magic. I think I like his article the best. Craig Sidorowitz 2015 at the Wizards Cupboard. And the Command Zone did an episode in 2015, but it's mostly talking about Graham Stark's Tree Folk Tribal Deck. And Eric Tiernan at Star City Games in 2016. In terms of, like, from what I've personally, like, learned the most from is uh, Tom from Commander Clash slash uh, EDH Radio. Uh, Anytime he streams, he walks through just about every step of the game and how he sees everything shaping up and he is eerily correct most of the time on what's going to happen and what is actually going to be the biggest turning points in the game so like just sit down watch one of his streams and you'll be very impressed by his threat assessment abilities Mm. never done that before he doesn't stream super often because he's a busy nurse but when he does it's usually worth checking out good to know cool all right so the main topic So, you know that guy at the table who played three lands and then still has no board state? He even played three tap lands in a row. He is clearly behind everybody else. He doesn't even have a blocker in comparison to anybody. And yet, you've decided to attack him, for he's the only one open. Because you think to yourself, he's open, it's a free attack, and I don't lose anything. And then he gets really annoyed and angry at you for some reason. Hmm. Yeah. Why, why could that be, you guys? Why could that be? Hmm. I think you might have just misread what the table was presenting to you. Yes, you probably made the correct identification in that you're not going to lose anything, so you've avoided the worst case scenario. But you didn't take into consideration that perhaps there was something else better that would have uh, affected the board state much better. So uh, I guess we should first start out talking about why is threat assessment important? Well, you don't want to hit the wrong guy. Yeah, that's usually important. And you want to keep the biggest guy down. Yeah. So people get angry when uh, (laughs) you're wrong. And when people are angry, they make very poor choices. I mean, that's that's, that's just a general theme in life. So... I've definitely been in that situation where I'm the guy who 
you've poked me one too many times when I am clearly not the threat at the board and I've just decided that the next game, it doesn't matter what's going to happen, I'm going to turn everything sideways and take out. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Revenge. Vendetta. Yeah. Or have you ever uh, been poked when you shouldn't have been and so you decided to let the guy who was already ahead win the game so you could just take out that, that player who poked you? Oh, somebody wrote a forum thread about you then. <laughs> if you go to a- any Magic the Gathering forum on any website, there's going to be at least one thread that's talking about new players, and at least one person in that thread is going to complain about how some new player in a multiplayer game, in fact, I think this applies to all multiplayer game forums, somebody's going to complain about the new player who just made everything happen wrong. Yeah, and it takes experience to figure out what's going on, but, you know, you just have to figure it out as you go along, and we're here to help. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're wrong about um, a threat, you will oftentimes shift the winning percentages of your own chances down 1% or 2%, and maybe somebody else is up 1% or 2%. All in all, it's not a huge thing once or twice. You know, that's just only a swing of, you know, 4% chance of, of winning or losing. But if you continue to make that mistake, that's something that can go up 10, 15% and suddenly you're just not going to be winning. And you get a reputation. Oh yeah, <laughs> you do definitely do. And then you start getting taken out because nobody else can, you get, you get to be the, the loose gun essentially and you don't want to be a loose gun in most games yeah if you yeah if you consider the game a game of arch enemy where the arch enemy can change every turn it can help you to reassess the threat of uh, of who's who's in a domineering position at any given time right so we can look at this in phases so before the game even starts everybody flips over their commanders Hey, take a look around. What commanders are being played? Hey, maybe some of them are considered Tier 1 commanders, which means that they are pretty dangerous, and in competitive metas, they might win by turn 3 or 5. Now, who are the current ones? There is a lot of debate about this, and this will vary by your playgroup and how your meta has adjusted to certain ones. Maybe maybe your meta plays so much artifact hate that Arkham Dagson doesn't even show up anymore. The Commander cast, they just had an episode 290 where they talk about Tier 1 Commanders. I'll throw out a list here. There's a lot of debate, but I'll say Animar, uh, Derevi can be annoying, certain Carador decks, maybe Mizzix, uh, everybody's got a Narset horror story, and Xur the Enchanter. Mm -hmm. I know in my meta, Prosh is a literal going to win on turn three to five, depending on uh, if he keeps a sketchy hand or not. Yeah. Is it Prosh Food Chain? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's his baby. He he brings it out once or twice a night that we play, and then he switches off to something else because he knows he will just win every single game against, you know, my uh, Mirren Rats deck or something like that. Because as aggro as uh, Relentless Rats is, it is not uh, fast enough to win against an infinite combo on turn three. Yeah, f- food chain decks are nasty. Yeah, that brings us to a point that the ultra-competitive versions of these commander decks, they tend to rely on certain combo piece cards. So like Prosh and Food Chain is one of them. Carador and Boon Weaver Giant is another combination. Mm-hmm. Yep. Animar and Cloudstone Curio. Mm-hmm. So if you've played against one of these competitive decks, you already have a good idea what to expect. Now, maybe they didn't make that kind of deck, and that's where things like Bribery or Acquire or Thada Adele, they come in handy because you can snoop through their deck and see if it's one of the troublesome ones. If you don't already know by turn three, (laughs) that is. Yeah, if you haven't already lost. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you see one of those high-value combo pieces in any deck, like... um. Talzri also plays Food Chain, and so does Animar. So if you see a Food Chain, you probably want to get rid of that Food Chain. Yeah, and some ways to do that. I like Nevermore in certain decks. Uh, Jester's Cap, Bitter Ordeal can be good. Denying Wind if you have some mana discounts. 
Uh, we got Nightmare Inclusion and Sadistic Sacraments if you're playing in basically mono black. And Hide and Seek, which is a split card. Yeah, there's also a uh, potential, uh, depending on what the exact threats are, but um, Pythe Needle and uh, Phyrexian Revoker are also uh, two of my favorites for uh, colorless uh, hate. Oh, yeah. Uh, they only take out one thing at a time, but sometimes that's enough. Yeah, there's also um, Voidstone Gargoyle that is basically a Nevermore and a Pithy Needle on the same card. Hmm. Well, I guess there's that uh, new Gideon one, the Gideon Nevermore. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Uh, Gideon's Intervention. That's the one. Cool. So what are some high stakes commanders that you should keep an eye out for? So things you should look for um, in terms of commanders, if you aren't super experienced and know like, oh man, Prosh, I need to keep an eye out for Prosh in particular, but you should probably look at what the commanders do. So if you see things like search your library, without paying its mana cost, graveyard to the battlefield, and uh, anything that makes a lot of mana, like... uh, the uh, new partner commander, uh, the uh, tap. Kaideli. Kaideli, yes, just like Kaideli. Or uh, Silvala. What's the new Silvala? Not so, not Explorer Return. Heart of the Wild. Silvala, Heart of the Wild. Silvala, Heart of the Wild, yeah. Yeah, we should do a big mana gruel episode with Neheb and Silvala. Ooh, that'd be fun. Maybe Sakiko, the snake that gets you mana with combat damage. Hmm, that sounds fun. Yeah. At least the games won't last forever. (laughs) That's true. And the next thing you should probably uh, figure out is player reputation. If you're sitting down for the first time, this is going to be probably the hardest thing for you to figure out. But just kind of keep your ears open and listen for like if some if like four people at the table lean in and go, you should really watch out for Barry. He's going to go off on turn four. You should probably be prepared for that. And you'll probably know for sure after that first game. Yeah. Yeah, it's not always reliable, but keep an ear on who's trash-talking who in a playful manner before the game. All right. So now that we've flipped over our commanders, what's the next thing we should look for? Okay, so we've actually started the game, and it's the early game. Maybe you have a 1-1, you played it on turn one, and you got to figure out who to poke on turn two if you want to. Hey! Who's got the most mana rocks? It's always a very valid question because they're going to be the most ahead on the next rotation. Yeah, so just poke them in the eye a little bit. Yeah, be on the lookout for the mana rocks that tap for more than one mana, like Soul Ring and uh, Grim Monolith. and Mana Crypt? Yeah, Mana Crypt for sure. Mana Vault? All those ones that are real cheap. Cards with the word mana in it tend to tap for quite a bit. (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) And now here comes a challenge question for you guys. If you had a 1-1 mana dork out, you don't have anything to cast this turn. Would you use that 1-1 mana dork to attack somebody else's uh, 1-1 that's untapped? Mm. Yes. I wouldn't use that to attack a 1-1, but I would generally attack if a 1-1 mana dork was the only blocker. Okay. Yeah. So the real question here is... Would you block with that 1-1 one, one mana dork? Nope. So why wouldn't you then attack with it? Well, it depends. Do I have something to do with that mana? If I don't, then I might attack with it. If I do, then I'm going to tap it for mana. So it's important to to realize that when people have 1-1 one, one mana dorks or just in general some value creature out, they aren't going to be blocking with it and make traits because the future value and reuse of those activated abilities is so much higher. So when somebody has a 1-1 out and you can attack them, but you're afraid of like some sort of combat trick and, you know, somehow losing out on your value creature, it's just not going to happen most of the time. And chances are you are just kind of, uh, giving the person who is furthest ahead the most benefit of the doubt in terms of that. I I block. I block and trade. I make bad trades early games sometimes just to 
sort of give myself the reputation of, uh, you better not attack me in the early game because I'll make a bad trade. Well, not a bad trade, but I'll set us both back. <laughs> and Dean, I'll do it. I'll do it every time. Yeah, yeah. Then I no, would no, no, love the... to make bad trades with you. That that sounds great. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, no, that's not exactly what I mean. I like to make bad moves, and I like to have the reputation of making bad moves. That way, you'll never know if I am making a bad move. <laughs> uh, I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I would not block with my 1-1, one, one, but I would not use it to attack either. Hmm. So it's it's one of those things where is if you are considering holding back because you're afraid of losing your guy, that's probably not the best choice in general. If you want to leave somebody behind for blocks, that's an entirely different conversation. But if you are afraid of losing your creature because somebody else has a creature that will take it out. It's not always the best, what would be considered the EV, the estimated value. So like the, the percentage of the times that you would be correct to make that attack into a 1-1 one, one dork is much higher than to not make that attack. If that makes mm -hmm. any sense to anybody. What I'm trying to say is, if you are trying to make the choice of attack or not attack, it should be a question of, is it better to attack or is it better to hold up a blocker? It's not a question of, will I lose my stuff? Does that make more sense? When I'm attacking someone who has a mana dork as a blocker, I want them to trade. Exactly. Especially if that person is the fur the person who is furthest ahead because you want to be able to take them back as much as possible. Yeah. And their mana dork gives them much more potential in future turns than the blocker that they could be right now. Exactly. And even if they don't block, you still took them down on life, which makes a small change in the game because that is a little bit less life they have to work with. And to reiterate this advice, we're still talking about the early game. Yeah. In the late game, you can use your mana dorks to block Kozilek, sure. That could be a good idea. Or to sacrifice to your <laughs> Annihilator triggers. Mm -hmm. So, we played a few turns, we made it to the mid-game. Who's the threat? Well, look around and see who has the most stuff. Yeah, lands count as stuff. Lands count as stuff. Cards in hand count as stuff. Cards in hand count as stuff. Uh, if they're playing a commander in black, then sometimes cards in a graveyard count as stuff. Maybe they're playing green. That also applies. Or white. That's always been the confusing thing about Abzan for me, is why green, white, and black, when you put them together, it's plus one, plus one counter synergy when they all love the graveyard so much. Well, there's Caridor. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah. you know, it's, it's just it's just a confusing thing to me in terms of flavor. But anyway, in the mid game, this is probably a good time to ask yourself if you're afraid of anybody, because at the mid game, that's usually when you can tell when a game is starting to uh, tip in somebody's favor. And if you're not particularly afraid of anybody. You're probably the uh, arch enemy, so be prepared to defend yourself. And you're still probably afraid of somebody, whoever's running the most uh, board wipes or something, probably. Yeah. Um, and this is the point where you should probably start recognizing combo pieces. You know, this is when a an Aloro player might get down a sanguine bond down or food chain hits the table, or Johnny Crass plays Paradox Engine. Well, anybody plays Paradox Engine, well, and all of a sudden, you know, the game's done. Sure. But. <laughs> Ad nauseum. Oh Ad nauseum, yeah. yeah. This is when you shouldn't be stingy with your spot removal or counter spells, because this is going to be the time where you can best affect your chances for winning. Yeah. And as you increase your vocabulary of 
game-winning combos, then you can start to learn to sandbag your removal and keep it held back because you know it's coming and you don't want to waste your removal on lesser things. And remember, sometimes you do have to use your removal on just value creatures or enchantments or something like that. You know, just if they if you look at their board state and you all of a sudden go, oh, they're going to draw 60 cards this way. This is not good. It's perfectly fine to to take out a value target at this point, too. Mm hmm. All right. Okay. How do we know when we've moved into the late game? Chances are. You either have almost no cards in hand, or you have, you know, like 30 cards in hand. It's <laughs> <laughs> also, it's possible it's, that life totals are very low at this point. Yeah, that, that's all. Or infinitely high. Sure. Commander's a weird game. There's also a chance that you just don't have a library anymore. It's, so... <laughs> <laughs> Is somebody about to lose the game? <laughs> That's a good... There you go. Have you been playing for five hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nate had the through line right there. If somebody is about to lose the game, you're probably at the late game. Yep. In general, what I try to do for uh, trying to uh, secure at least not last place is try to figure out in my deck, who do I have outs to? If I have a deck that has four board wipes and I'm facing against a tokens deck and a mill deck, I'm going to take out the mill deck player because I know chances are I'm going to draw into one of my board wipes and I'm going to be able to take out the tokens player and win from there. Or if I, yeah. it's, it, you have to, you have to sit down and figure out who you have or what resources do you have left in your library to win. This is where knowing your deck is probably the best. What if you're playing against Nate and he's playing a token mill deck? Well. <laughs> in the form of Una. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> not serious. <laughs> not exactly. Well, what you going to do, Patrick? <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I've beaten Una before. Uh, basically outramp her in the beginning. Yeah. And and keep removing Una from the field. Anyway, let's not talk about how to defeat Una. <laughs> let's talk about where you're in, you're in the late game. And uh who do you have outs against? Uh yeah, so in some of my decks I might have Acid Rain and Parish and Hibernate and Nature's Ruin that just demolish green decks, and then I save the green players for last and kill all the Mardu and Orzov. Kill them first. So how do you make that decision, though, to save green for last? Well, because I have a bunch of cards in my deck that destroy green decks, specifically. Oh, I thought, are all of those cards that you just listed anti-green? Yeah, Acid Rain will take out the forests, and Hibernate sends all the green stuff back to their hand. Ah, uh, I see. And Perish and Nature's Ruin kill all the green creatures. And I have a deck that does that, and I save the green players for last. That's, uh, it's like eating the green gummy bears last? Yeah, because I have a specially designed flamethrower that only destroys green gummy bears. Perfect. And sour apple is tasty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I personally feel like my, my strength is in the late game and trying to figure out what my outs are. And I'm not sure what you guys think your, your personal strengths are, but I, I tend to be able to focus like a laser when it comes to uh, late game plays, it tends it tends to be if I'm alive at the late game, I'll be able to find an out to win. Yeah, I feel like if if I make it to a late game and don't have my well, I suppose this is true of any anybody playing, but if I make it to the late game and my plans don't go horribly awry, well, I, I try to run um, win conditions that don't really depend on having an out against one player as as much as just. Um, beating the whole table so if i can make it to the late game i can just combo off right so that's that's really what the the advantage to a combo win is is that you don't have to worry about any particular player you're just going to win you're trying to do your thing mm -hmm. and your thing turns the mid game into the late game very quickly is what a combo deck does it can and a competitive deck will turn the early game into the late game very quickly 
Yep, depends on the combo and all your mana rocks. All right. Yeah, some people are very down on combo decks, especially newer players. They don't really like combo decks because they they feel like they can't see the combo coming and it sort of comes out of nowhere and wins the game. Yeah, you have to know about the cards ahead of time. Definitely. But combo also is a little bit more fair in that you don't have to pick on any one person by attacking one person or two people. You just get to beat everybody at once. So that's that's sort of a side mm-hmm. point, but... <laughs> yeah so anybody else have anything to say about uh threat assessment i would say that counter spell decks and decks with heavy removal tend to be for more experienced players who know what to look for and what to get rid of right so if you're a new player maybe you don't want to play mono blue burrow even though everybody says is awesome and it is, but you have to know what to counterspell. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. If you're counterspelling someone's Birds of Paradise, then uh, maybe there's bigger stuff out there to worry about. Have you had that happen to you? Not in a long time. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the last time someone tried to counterspell something like that. Mm-mm. Uh, do you agree with the uh, Tier 1 list? Do you have any additions or subtractions? Uh, oh, uh, I guess we could go back to that a little bit. Some commanders have a reputation for being tier one, but maybe aren't quite so scary anymore. Some commanders that I don't really see uh, get played in tier one so much anymore are Kalia and um, Rafik of the Many. I just don't see them very much uh, because they're com- they're combat based decks. Whereas most of the other uh, tier one decks are either combo or stacks based, like Derevi is stacks prison. Kalia and Rafik of the Many are both combat based. They'll they'll one shot you, and it's they'll, they'll make one player lose very quickly, but they won't win the game, and so they're just not quite tier one. Hmm. What do you guys think about that? Do you think it's because they're combat based? I think it is. I don't think that there really are any combat-based decks that are... I mean, Kalia, I guess you could sort of call dropping Kalia and then Armageddoning the board, blowing up all the lands. I guess you could call that combo, but it's not exactly combo. I mean, what do you think? Do do you guys think of Kalia and Rafik as Tier 1 anymore? I haven't played against Rafik in a long time. Yeah. There's certainly a um, a phase of, of... There are waves of of what is cool and what isn't cool at the moment. Fads and trends? Yeah, fads and trends. Um, In terms of tiers, a lot of them, it's it's a lot of rock, paper, scissors um, in terms of what is actually going to be worthwhile. But do you think that any any combat-based commander can be a tier one? Are all the tier one decks... Combo? I think they are. Or stacks. Yes, Dur- they Durevi are. Derevi and Zura are both combo stacks. Yeah. Can you be both combat and combo? Yes. Yeah. Prosh is that. Yes. Mm. Prosh is actually probably the tier one aggro list. It's a little more glass canny than a lot of other of a lot of the other food chain combos. But uh the win condition is usually either to uh, get infinite amount of kobolds and then kill everybody in one combat turn. Or the combo kill is to have perforos or impact tremors out while you make your infinite combo kobolds. Those are mm-hmm. So, yep. Or goblin bombardment. Yep. So I think Thrasia, uh, Thrasios and Timna both see a lot of, are starting to see play as tier one partner commanders. Hmm. Yeah, Thrasios is really just a mana sink for decks that are already making infinite mana. Yeah, he is a value engine with above average stats. I think he's a 2-3 and he only costs 2. Yeah. Yeah. You'll notice that the ultra competitive decks have a very low mana curve. It generally doesn't get higher than 5 or 6. You'd be surprised if it ever got any further than that. Tier 1 commander tends to look like multiplayer legacy mm-hmm. yeah there's there there are quite a few different lists of uh ranking all the commanders by what tier they're in and there's some variance there's a lot of variance 
And you can tell that some metas have adjusted to Arkham or they haven't. <laughs> Has your meta adjusted to Arkham, Nate? I think I got a pretty good handle on Arkham. Is that to <laughs> blow up all of Arkham's artifacts or to blow up Arkham every time? Oh, both. <laughs> yeah, why not both, Dean? Why not both? I don't know. It does seem good. Yeah, get them out. Go. All right. Does that cover it? I think so. Should we talk about some games we played? Sure. Yeah, we played a bunch. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we can talk about all of these. Yeah, let's just talk about the best ones. The ones you yeah, want. Yeah, like pick your favorite. <laughs> Last game. Uh, <laughs> how about how, how about the one where my note is thinking about casting riot control just for the life gain? <laughs> game two. That was a sad game for me. Oh, uh, what is? Let's see what riot control does. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you gain one life for each creature your opponents control. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to you this turn. For two and a white. Instant. And I was thinking about casting that just for the life game because uh, ugh, I was playing uh, Kanea Sentiro. It was my uh, first draft of uh, Aikido Control, which is where you try to turn your opponent's attacks against them and, and reflect the damage back at them. And both Nate and Patrick were not playing combat decks. Not really. Oh, yeah, I was. Uh, sort of. Yeah, but the idea is to reflect lots of damage back, and you were playing King of the Car with uh, vehicles, so I didn't really feel like reflecting two damage back in your face. Yeah, no, I got in a, I got in a car or two. Vroom vroom. Yeah, I was playing my updated Scarab God deck. I had a lot of mana in that game, I believe, and so I was just casting a whole bunch of spells into a consuming aberration. And then finally finishing up with uh, Rise of the Dark Realms to get everybody's creatures. Yeah, it was pretty nasty. <laughs> I don't remember what happened then. Yeah, I don't remember who won that, but I remember that you had two Nightmare Lashes on your King Makar at one point. Yeah, Nightmare Lash is pretty good in a mono black deck uh, because you have a bunch of swamps and then you play a Sculpting Steel and you have two Nightmare Lashes and then you get uh, plus 34 on your creatures. And I think... Uh, I think it came down to a rogue's passage. Yeah. Yeah, I think you won that game just because, like, I was going to win on the crack back, and I had just cleared out your King Makar, and I was really hoping you would forget you had your Nightmare Lashes. Nope. That that was my line of play right there. <laughs> I had them. <laughs> and I remembered I had them. And I remembered I could equip them onto somebody else and hit you. So I did. Our next game after that, your Nightmare Lashes made me want to play Core Lash or Blackblade, who also runs Nightmare Lash. I think, yeah. Hey. Game three, I think that was the first game I won that night, and possibly the only game that I won that night. Oh no, you did that. Uh, you did not win game three. Was, I won that was game. Was it? Oh, you you won game four. Oh. <laughs> you ran back Core Lash. Yeah, game three was the one where I uh, pack ratted you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, but Corlash did break my losing streak in game four. Using, uh, <laughs> <laughs> using Fire Shrieker and Sword of Vengeance to hit everybody for massive amounts of commander damage. Mm-hmm. And you extorted with Crypt Ghast a little bit? Uh, a little bit. Sometimes I forgot. You shouldn't forget to do that, though. Yeah. Another thing you shouldn't forget, if you have Leech Ridden Swamp, and uh, some extra black mana. You shouldn't forget to use it a couple of times on the end of your last opponent's turn. Get them for one. Because they add up. Yeah, who was that? Was that you or was that Patrick? Oh, that was That me. was me in the first game. I forgot to use it a couple times. I don't think it would have mattered, but it would have made me feel better. <laughs> well. And then in our last game... Uh, yeah, we had a, a famous misplay. Yeah, we did. Totally missed it. This was game five in a row, everybody. So we were pretty tired. I had a 49-49 uh, throw Mac, and I was going to throw it at Dean's face for... 39. I don't... For... No, eight. Dean Dean tried to destroy it, and you cast Fling in response. No, other way no, it was the other way around. 
There was a removal sandwich, oh, that, though. That might yes, be possible, there was. yes. Yeah, Dean was trying to kill, and then you cast Fling in response, and then... I cast Hero's Demise in response to the Fling. And at this point, uh, we just let that... let my Thromac die. But in reality, it wouldn't work, because the sacrifice of Thromac is part of the cost of casting Fling. So Dean uh, wouldn't have a chance to actually respond to the uh, the cost in that case. So a hero's demise would not be able to target throw mark. Exactly. Man, Fling is so broken. <laughs> it's a really good card. <laughs> no, it definitely is. It's not right to run in every deck, but in some decks, it's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I've definitely written about Fling where I said, and hey, if you, uh, if you can't do anything else with it, at least you could fling it at your opponent's face for two damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, in one of my articles, I mentioned using fling to to fling a bad card at somebody's face. Okay. That's why you play the bad cards. Yeah. Fling shows up in Crush the Blood Braided a bit. Throw mock a bit. Brian Stout Arm a bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, probably Hamlet back oh. Goliath. Yeah. But we don't talk about him. Hey, why not? No, he's he's, he's got a town on his back. Yeah, he does. Uh, okay. That was our last game for the night. How about some pets? Pets! The Pets Update! Okay, so uh, we went out of town, my wife and I, for a week, and we hired some pet sitters. And one of our cats lost their collar. We don't know where it is. So you'll hear less jingling in the background. Oh, I like the jingling. Well, you'll hear less of it. There's only one collar with a bell on it right now. Well, no. speaking of collars, uh, our animals have fleas, so Hattie and Miri have a flea collar. Uh, they each have a flea collar. They don't have to share the one between the two of them. And Miri's actually smells like a citronella mm. candle. Which is pretty cute. What? They have different flavor flea no, collars? No, Hattie's just smells like a flea collar. It's just Miri's that smells like a lemon citronella candle. Yeah, mm. and... Uh, if you are a keen listener, you would hear that I'm in a different room right now. It's because we just moved. And Talon is very, very happy that our couch and our bed are actually in the same place again. He was very worried about that. Uh, like, where'd the couch go? Where'd the couch go? There's only a bed here. But now that they are together again, he can relax a little. Aww. What's his preferred area of the bed or the couch wherever a person is oh okay that i like if you, if somebody is in in the living room he goes over to the couch if somebody's in the bedroom he goes over to the bed it doesn't matter so long as there's somebody there what if someone is at the dinner table well he you he actually has a bed under the dinner table <laughs> right now <laughs> of course he does oh well, it's home base. Yeah. That's the best bed of all. The one near the food. <laughs> you get the food, you get to relax, and you get to look cute the whole time. So, those are our pet updates. You can tweet your pet updates to us at Command Time. And if you don't have a pet, maybe consider adopting one. This week, you could adopt Ellis from BB Humane Society's Desperate House Dogs. And Patrick will <laughs> click the link and give you a cutesy description of this dog. <laughs> He's got a goofy smile on his yeah, face. Yeah, he does. He has big floppy ears. He has a big tongue. He looks very serious. No, that's not a serious <laughs> face. Well, serious about having fun. Oh, it's a female. It a female. We got the... Oh, Ellis. Hi, Ellis. And her age is puppy. Yeah, that's a good... Oh. oh, guys, did you know that I saved a puppy this past weekend? Oh, yeah, tell us about that. Hmm? Yeah, I was driving to get food for the girlfriend and I, and I saw a puppy limping across the road as I was driving. So I stopped, pulled over, and I took her to a vet. I, somebody came running up and said that the dog was thrown out the car. Thrown out a car, oh. yeah. And she was just this sweet little little pup who just wanted everything to be okay. Aww. And yeah. So hopefully she'll be up for adoption at the Humane Society soon. 
near me. Yeah, and when she comes up, we can feature her on the show. Somebody near you can adopt her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Inspiring message. Rescue puppies. And kitties, because Nate's a cat person. Yeah, I am. Oh, no. There's a pug near us who's up for adoption, and she's adorable. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I, will, I will not show this to Rebecca, and then we'll have two dogs. I thought you were going to have two dogs after you after you found the puppy. Yeah, there was a chance that that would have happened, but we can't afford a second dog right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that. Uh, <laughs> I know that situation. Maybe, maybe when when Rebecca's out of law school. That's a good time. Mm-hmm. So, on the next Commander Time... Uh, let me check the schedule. I think we're doing articles Ooh. next. That sounds right. And then maybe we can work on some big mana gruel decks for the one after that. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, also, we had some suggestions for the next Break That Card. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we got a suggestion for Mirage Mirror. And another one yeah. for... Was it Assault Suit? Baron Glory. Yeah, Assault Suit. I want to look at Assault Suit. I think Baron Glory is probably the least fun option possible. We'll all just play horrible stacks decks. Uh, can't attack two or planes while can control and can't be sacrificed. Mm, yeah, Assault Suit could be fun. Yeah, I think Assault Suit, and I actually think Mirage Mirror is also a very nice option. I think there are a lot of different ways you could break that. Yeah. So many ways. So uh, when we do our next break that card, maybe we'll do Mirage Mirror. Thanks for the suggestion, Ben Fogarty. Thank you, Ben. Yes. Thank you, Ben. Outro. All right. And then we'll play a song. Visit us at patreon.com slash commander time. You can find me on Twitter at Grubfellow. At Detective Yarmitz. At Mr. Plorg. I went for a picnic in the woods with my sandwiches made of pickles, mayonnaise, and tuna. T-U-N-A tuna. I met her in a deep, dark, secluded glen. I beseeched her her name in a regal voice. She said, Una. O-O-N-A, Una. O-O-O-O-Una. Well, she ramped all day and ramped all night, bringing men of rocks into the fight. A mystical tutored for my combo piece, and it turned into a swarm of pissed off fairies. Well, I'm not the most.